this pleasure and joy to welcome and ask you to welcome on the second night of the Advent Mission, Miss Christine Watkins. Welcome, how nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. So this talk is called Stories of Encounters with Jesus and Mary and Living in the Presence of God. And you know, when I thought about this subject, I realized that people who have these unusual encounters with God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus and Mary, tend to either be very, very holy and very close to God, or hell-bent on traveling the wrong way. And when people are traveling down the wrong road, like I was, and I know this from personal experience, we're just going and going and going and we really don't think to exit. We can't see that the road is getting darker and narrower and more painful. We just keep trudging ahead. And because of that, God sometimes, because of his love for us, his grace and his mercy, he starts getting louder when we can't hear him. And he starts getting more colorful and vibrant when we can't see him. So it's kind of like this situation where this man, this elderly man was driving down the freeway and his cell phone rang and it was his wife and she said with an urgent tone, Herman, Herman, I just heard on the news that there's a car near where you are going the wrong way on Interstate 280. Please, Herman, be careful. And Herman said, oh, it's not just one car, it's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> Did half of you get it? <laughs> okay, another one. So. There are these two priests, they're outside their parish and they're holding up these signs. And it says, turn yourself around before it's too late. And this car goes by and he says, oh, you religious nuts, put down your signs. And they hear this screeching and then this splash of water. They hold up their signs, it says, turn yourself around before it's too late, stop. And another person yells out their car window, idiots! And you hear this screech and water. And one of the priests, he looks at the other and he says, do you think we should change our signs to say the bridge is out? <laughs> so I want to share with you some amazing stories. And I'm going to ask my friend Vince to, in my purple bag, there's a box of uh, the Men of Mary book that I want to read from. If you could get that for me. So in this book, the first story is of a man named Michael Leitner. And I want to tell you his story because it's just so human, and it shows how God sometimes gets very, very loud. Michael, he didn't particularly appreciate being raised in a very Catholic family. Uh, once again, can we hear it for Brian Kravick handing the book? <laughs> excellent job, excellent job, Brian, well done. And so he didn't particularly like being raised in the Catholic faith. Whenever his family gave him a Catholic to do, like go to mass, pray the rosary, he would get very passive aggressive. My son, my 14 year old is now doing that. Uh, but you, you girls aren't, right? Are you teens? Do you get passive aggressive when you're asked to do something Catholic? No, none of them do, only my son. So my son sits like this. Are you praying? So I'm praying with my heart. Hail Mary, full case, Lord. Are you praying? I'm praying. I pray better silently. So Michael was like that. 
When he goes off to college, he thinks, oh, now I have freedom. I'm not bound by all these rules, all this Catholic stuff. So he starts drinking and he does some drugs and he has some girlfriends and he has more girlfriends. And he's just kind of spiraling into the world at a rapid pace. He ends up in a year of college coming home for Thanksgiving. He takes a nap. He wakes up and he sees his mother's tear-streaked face through a cellophane bag of marijuana dangling before him. While Michael was out partying, his mother had been really into Medjugorje, where the Virgin Mary is allegedly appearing in our lifetime. And she loved it as much as Michael loved partying. So she was always trying to get her family to go to Medjugorje. They didn't want to budge. Michael just wanted to be a pro football player. That's all he ever wanted. And it wasn't out of his reach because at age 14, he was six foot four, 286 pounds. My son, who I've just mentioned, is age 14, five foot three, 100 pounds. I mean, if Michael sat on him, he wouldn't even know he was there. And so his sister saw the whole thing, this cellophane bag dangling over Michael's face and said, ha ha, now you have to go to Medjugorje. You have to go to Medjugorje. And his mother said, well, that's a good idea. And Michael said, God, no, not going with you. But his mother was just as stubborn as he was. He ends up there, and once there in Medjugorje, his mother says, there's only one thing I ask of you, son. I ask that when you're here, you go to confession. If not for God, not for you, then for me. And he said, yes. So he ends up in the confessional, and he thinks, I'm going to make this priest's ears bleed. I'm going to shock him left and right. So he names one sin after another sin after another sin. And the priest isn't phased, and Michael's wondering why he can't get this guy riled up. And the priest begins to give him absolution. At that moment, Michael senses another presence in the confessional with him. Suddenly, his legs are pinned underneath him. His body is thrust 30 degrees at a back angle. His head hits the back of confessional. His calves are pinned underneath him. He can't move an inch in any direction. And by this point, he was over 300 pounds, six foot four, could bench press 400 pounds. He could not move. Well, of course, God didn't keep him in that position. To make a long story short, and I won't reveal the whole thing, the rest of the story is in Of Men and Mary. He has about 20 minutes of sheer ecstasy. The Lord brings him into a union of love and ecstatic joy that he says is just not part of our earthly experience. He comes away from this, knows there's a God, knows without a doubt that Jesus loves him. He comes back to Medjugorje six months later. This time when his mother asks, do you want to go? He says, yes, absolutely. He ends up at a healing service there. And being the big guy that he is, sometimes people, when they're prayed over by very powerful hands, anointed with the Holy Spirit, people are what's called slain in the spirit. Have you ever seen that? And when they do get kind of flimsy in their body and just rest so peacefully, there's usually people to catch them. So Michael, being a, a Leviathan <laughs> of a man, was catching people, and he ends up with this priest praying over a woman in a wheelchair. The woman had legs the circumference of his wrist. Her spinal cord had been severed in a car accident. Six months after the car accident, spinal meningitis set in the lower part of her body. She was completely paralyzed. 
And Michael thought, there's absolutely no point in praying for this woman. She is not gonna get up and walk. Why is this priest still trying? So he wanted to leave. And when he tried to pull away from the woman, he sensed God saying, no, stay, be here with her. What do you want, God? Do you want me to pray for her? Is that what you want? He said flippantly. Silence. Okay then. Okay, God. Make her walk. Show us your power. And then God spoke. One of those rare occasions where someone hears his voice and said, Michael, if I get this woman up, and I make her walk. Will you enter the seminary? And Michael said, absolutely not. And 20 minutes go by and he's thinking, I just, I just wanna be in the NFL. All I've ever wanted since I was eight years old was to be a professional football player, but it would be pretty cool to see her walk. We said, Okay, make her walk. Not five seconds go by. No one told the woman to do so. She stands up, gets behind the wheelchair, and starts pushing it around. So she starts going around the perimeter of the church. And Michael thinks, Oh no, somebody stop her, tackle her, get her down. And he starts to change the rules. He's like, no, 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 no. Um, okay, Lord, uh, if, she, if she stops on this tile right here in front, if she, no, Lord, if she doesn't stop on this particular tile, I am not entering the seminary. And he's watching her. Just push in her wheelchair, puts both feet on that very tile he had in mind and sits back down. Needless to say, Michael was not happy. But today, Father Michael Leitner is a very fulfilled priest in his vocation. Sometimes, God is very loud when we're not paying attention. Have, it, have any of you seen The Greatest Showman, that movie that just came out? A couple of, have any of you seen Christopher Robin? Okay. These are two recent movies, and I mention them because they have a similar theme. These two men, Christopher Robin and Barnum, of Barnum and Bailey, they started going the wrong way. Their priorities were off. They were not taking the right road. The movies make that very clear. For Christopher Robin, Winnie the Pooh shows up from his childhood. And Christopher Robin is not happy about that. Winnie the Pooh is messing up his plans to go along the road he's going on. In The Greatest Showman, everything that he's built up in life starts to crumble to the ground. For both of these men, things are going against their will. They are not happy. But when everything crumbles for one and Winnie the Pooh shows up for the other, they're put on the right road again. They end up clearly on the right path. Those movies show us how God works with us sometimes. That's why our souls connect with those stories. Another story, another story in the book of Men and Mary. This one is Rick Wendell. Rick Wendell, he had it all. Growing up, God gave him so many gifts, extremely intelligent, artistic. Um, he was a real daredevil. He could do anything he put his mind to. Girlfriends, had lots of fun at school. He was told there was a God who loved him, but he never really experienced that and didn't have a good Catholic education. 
But his family was Catholic, his mom in particular. And he ends up in his 20s becoming very successful. He was what the world would say is a success. He had the big house on the waterfront. He had several cars. He had some motorcycles. He had several girlfriends. Everybody wanted to be around him. He was the life of the party. At his parties, they'd even have to rent porta potties. You know you're on top of the world when you get the porta potties at the party. He was somebody who had several gifts, artistic, musical, intellectual, everything. He ends up, age 30, he's got 15 men working for him in a construction business. He has an accident, a nail hits his face. He needs stitches. His mom drives him to the hospital. He gets the stitches. She picks him up. She's driving him home. On the way home, she stops at a grocery store. He waits in the car. He's very impatient. His heart starts to beat. His heart starts to beat faster. He knows something is terribly wrong with him. He gets out of the car. He goes through the doors of the grocery store and he collapses. He actually goes into cardiac arrest. The ambulance immediately takes him out, but he codes as the ambulance is driving away. He's clinically dead. They're trying to resuscitate him completely unsuccessful. They take him to the hospital. They're doing everything they can to revive him. It's not working. He is dead. He is gone from an anaphylaxis reaction to the anesthesia of the stitches used to repair his wound. He goes into a beautiful light. And I want to describe to you what he says about that experience. Soon I was amidst this light. Intuitively, I understood that I was in the presence of God. I didn't simply think this. I knew this beyond and before any question I'd ever had. I knew that God is. God is the most obvious thing there could possibly be. I also knew instantaneously that one human lifespan is but a blink within that reality. And yet this life that each person is given by God is profoundly important. What we do with it is critical, as if life were a test, but not one that will pass or fail, a test of who we are. The most profound part of my experience by far was knowing that God is love. Never had I realized that I could be loved like that, with a love so perfect, so pure, so intense, so marvelous, that nothing else mattered. My dad loved me, but he hadn't been able to express it because his own father had not taught him how to love, nor his father before him. Dad couldn't bring himself to do so much as tell me I was a good boy. My fiance loved me, and I loved her, at least as much as we knew of romantic love. My mother was thinking of love when she had me baptized on Valentine's Day in 1960. Mom adored me and was the image of love in our family. Yet nothing was like this. I was in the presence of a love so intense that I didn't care about anything else. There was no need for anything else. This love was absolutely fulfilling in every way. A love that I had always looked for, but never found. A love one would never want to be separated from. So he has this experience of being in the very presence of God. He's, com he's in this light and suddenly he's yanked away from the light and he doesn't want to leave. Suddenly, in the emergency room, he's on the table 
and his arm shoots up and wraps around his fiance and his mom. It's a medical miracle. People don't know what to do. They put him in another room and they think it must be some damage. He was gray, he was frozen. He was perfectly healthy. They keep him for surveillance just in case. Three days later, he has another experience. He has one experience after another. I'm just gonna relay two of the hundreds in his story. At dawn on the Lord's day, my third day in the hospital, I had another mystical experience. A dream that was not a dream. In it, I relived the experience of dying. My body began to writhe in intense mental and spiritual anguish as I felt the loss of my life. Horrified, I received the spiritual and true knowledge that if I had gone to judgment, my life was forfeit. Instead of experience union with God in the way that I had, I would have received an internal sentence, banishment. For years, I had scared myself to death by doing extreme sports. But nothing I'd ever experienced remotely came close to my reaction. A paralyzing terror ripped through my being, causing my heart race to skyrocket and my blood pressure to shoot up. It was a fear like I'd never known. For a fleeting moment, I experienced the complete abandonment and separation from God and others without the hope of ever being reunited. I was going to be cast out without parole into a lonely, solitary torment forever because through my thoughts, words, and actions, I chose hell without consciously knowing that I had. I would not wish this experience on my worst enemy. Then he goes on to say, none of us think that we're that bad. We assume that there is always someone worse than we are, that perhaps that other person might deserve hell. Or we think that no one deserves hell. Many of us are taught to believe that God so loves the world, or at least me, that he would never send anyone, or at least not me, there. Or perhaps we believe that hell does not exist. We are wrong. At our own personal judgment, which none of us can escape, we will know full well where we are lacking and what destiny suits our soul. Now, we have two very different experiences. Father Michael and Rick Wendell end up understanding God in a way that few of us do here on earth. And the day that Father Rick died, he ends up Father Rick, yes, was a Friday at 3 p.m. Does anyone know what Friday at 3 p.m. is? Yes, it's the hour of mercy. It's the hour that Jesus died on the cross, 3 p.m. on a Friday, so that we might live. So the good news for all of you here, and I really want to stress the children whom Jesus loves very much, you don't have to fear anything if you love Jesus. You have that beautiful light to look forward to. That is your destiny, my dear children. You are so fortunate and you are called to bring other people, people you meet into that beautiful destiny with you. We are so lucky to be Catholic. Yes, sometimes the rosary is boring. Sometimes mass is boring. Sometimes you're like, why are my parents so strict? Why don't let me do what I wanna do if I could only do what I wanna do? Well, you know what? These men did what they wanted to do. 
it didn't work out so well. It didn't work out so well. You are so lucky. I'd like to show you, I figured you'd be curious about what Rick Wendell and Michael and the other four men in the Of Men and Mary book look like. So we're gonna show you a trailer now. The full title of the book is Of Men and Mary, How Six Men Won the Greatest Battle of their lives. What the book reveals, among other things, is that in the heart of every man, indeed in the heart of every individual, is something so beautiful. A priest I know once said, if we could but see the beauty of just one human soul, we would weep with joy and wonder. God has a perfect plan for each of us. God has a perfect plan for you. And these stories really get you in touch with what that plan is. And for those of you watching the video or the live stream, you can go to www.queenofpeacemedia.com if you're interested in seeing the videos, the free videos, or the books like of Men and Mary that can show you these realities that we sometimes just forget. We've forgotten that the only way to reach heaven, to reach that light, is to become a saint. So what happens is people are saying, I don't understand what God's plan is for me. I have no idea. He doesn't speak to me. God's plan for you, for me, is to become a saint. He has that plan for you. And we are living, as you probably can tell, in one of the darkest times of humanity, spiritually speaking. But what that means is that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So yes, there has never been a time to vote more quickly down the wrong road. But there has never been a time in the history of the world to become a saint in the flesh so easily. Because when there's so much darkness, God in his mercy compensates for that. And he shines for us more brightly. He pours more graces. He gives more mercy to say, you open your heart up that much and I'm going to rush in and save you and make everything better. And he's proving that time and time again. What's happening is he's pouring graces on all of us. But much of the world is just dropping the graces. He doesn't waste a single grace that he drops so all those graces go to you. All the graces that others are dropping go to you. So if you're the only one in your family who's a believer, who comes to church, who accepts graces, who loves God, then he's going to send you all the graces that your family is rejecting so that you can be more and more brilliant, so that you can be more and more of light to them and to others and the world. God always compensates. God always makes things as good as they possibly can be. It's much better to become a saint through our own will, through our own choices, than to become a saint against our will, which is what happens in purgatory. That's why we want to shoot for heaven. Don't shoot for purgatory because you might miss. Shoot way up, and if you end up in purgatory, everybody in purgatory ends up in heaven. You're going to be better than okay. But if you tell somebody today, 
I want to be a saint. Is the world going to cheer you on? Or are they kind of going to look at you like you're a weirdo? Nowadays, if you tell somebody you want to be a saint, it's like telling somebody you want to be a freak. I mean, people read the lives of things and go, whoa, look at that. Oh my gosh, what are these people doing? Oh, the irony of that is we're supposed to be like that. Yes, we might not reach the great heights that some of the greatest saints reached, but we can all enter sainthood. Sainthood is a basic requirement of entering heaven. Imagine if heaven was full of sinners. Okay, you're in heaven, and Jesus has made this beautiful mansion just for you. Remember, he says, I have gone before you to prepare a place for you to go. So Jesus already has a beautiful place prepared for every one of you when you get there. He's so excited to show it to you. There are mystics who've seen this, have seen, experienced this. They have these visits to heaven and they say, everything I loved was there. It was the perfect place for me. But imagine you're in heaven and Jesus is now letting in sinners and you leave your beautiful mansion that Jesus has prepared for you and you're flying around the universe and you're having a really good time and you come back to your heavenly home, everything's stolen. And when you check your voice messages, there's a mean message from your mother-in-law. Would that still be heaven? It doesn't make any sense. So people like St. Ignatius of Loyola, who became a saint, he made a decision. It's up to all of us to make that decision and say, I am going to be a saint. Do you think God will let you down if you're determined? Never. Never. You say, I'm going to be a saint, and you mean it with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, then it shall be done to you. St. Ignatius of Loyola, big sinner. He's convalescing. He starts reading a book of the lives of the saints and Jesus. And you know what he says to himself? St. Dominic did that, so I have to do that too. St. Francis did that, so I have to do that too. And the whole world was changed because he made that decision of his own free will. How are you going to use the beautiful gift of free will that God has given you? To explain a little bit how the world's focus is off in this regard. When we're created, we're created to have two natures. One is the body, the flesh. The other is the soul, the spirit. One is created to end up dying. The other is created to live forever, either in the ecstasy of God or the darkness of hell. What's happening in our world today is that the vast majority of human beings are focusing on the nature that is going to die. They're working really hard to help the body, but they've neglected the soul. So there's a huge imbalance. We are gifted with this body. This body is such a precious gift, so precious that we can take this flesh and move it right into paradise. We could die and step right into paradise and have a glorified body. Or this can be a junkyard. This can be a, a junkyard where Satan deposits his filth. And this body can take us to a horrible place forever. What are we doing with this body? 
We need to be very careful to not be distracted. The devil is in the distractions. Now, what do you see happening in today's world around distractions? Are people moment to moment thinking, I'm with Jesus? You know, when we're distracted, we have to realize that we're bringing Jesus into that distraction with us. He's experiencing that distraction. He's with us at all times. If we're doing something we shouldn't be doing, we don't want Jesus with us. Think about it. Is there something I do that I'm just saying, Jesus, can you, can you go over there for a while while I do this thing? I really don't want you knowing about it. Some of the things we're doing, it's all about the screen. It's all about a false life. The average American is spending 10 to 11 hours every day in front of a screen. What are we doing? What are we looking at? What are we listening to? What are we absorbing? Because our souls are getting totally distracted by this constant stimulation, this constant input. We are not able to silence ourselves very easily now. It's extremely hard. Did you know that social media engineers, video game engineers, all these people, pornography engineers, they create their content to addict the human brain. They know exactly what they're doing. And all these studies have gone out that kids that have all this screen time, they're developing ADHD. They're developing learning disorders. They're getting anxious. Teenage girls in particular are getting very depressed the more they're on social media. Boys are getting addicted to video games. Some can't even function in society. Boys and girls, the average age that they're exposed to pornography is 11. Everybody's getting addicted. Is that God's plan for our lives? Or are we getting hijacked? Is the human soul getting hijacked? Are we being fooled? You bet we're being fooled. Two men, you can watch it on YouTube, who were part of engineering Facebook feel so bad about what they've done that they've gone public with their repentance. They're saying, we knew what we were doing. We knew what kind of animal we were creating, yet we did it anyway. We tried to manipulate human love, human weakness, and we knew how to get people because we wanted profit and we wanted power. And that's behind the video games, even Candy Crush. There's this really fun game that everybody liked. Oh, people thought it was fine because it wasn't violent. Well, the man who engineered it, he saw that it was ruining lives, that people couldn't stop playing it. His conscience got to him. He took it off the market because he couldn't handle what he was doing to people. Don't be fooled. The way we get to heaven is moment by moment. We are, another way we're getting fooled is Satan has told us, worry about eternity later when you die. You know, you don't have to think about the end of your life right now. No. Every moment of our lives, we're standing in eternity. Right now, Depending on the condition of my soul, I'm either standing in heaven or in a certain level of purgatory or in hell. I'm in one of those places right now because I'm in an eternal present. It is a mistake to think I can take care of that later. No, 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 no. At our personal judgment, we're going to live every moment of our lives again. We review all of this. So I know personally, I'm not gonna enjoy reviewing the first half of my life. And I'm working very hard to be proud of reviewing the second half. 
Come on there. Great job. Oh, you got him there. Thank you so much. Let's keep going. Woohoo! It could be a blast that explodes into ecstasy, that explodes into light and joy and fullness and love. Or it could be, oh, you saw that? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, that was kind of selfish. That was kind of mean. Yeah, I knew you wouldn't like that. Oh, you mean that was wrong? Oh. What experience do we want to have? It's up to us. It's only up to us. We are the only ones responsible for our own souls. We save our souls or we condemn them. God never chooses that. It's our choice. Some people nowadays, they say, God didn't tell me what to do, so I didn't know what to do. For instance, with abortion, I know so many women, I've helped them heal. God forgives anything. But in the moment, they said, I asked God, what should I do? And he didn't tell me. We have to stick with the Bible and the catechism. These answers have already been given. Okay, it's a mistake to go directly to God to ignore the church's teachings, which are very clear. They're all written down. Jesus didn't say, I give you my church, I give you the catechism, I give you the magisterium, I give you the Bible, but it's not really correct. So what I want you to do is figure it out yourselves, because I didn't really give you the truth. Would God do that? Would God do that? Or did he put it right at our fingertips and say, here it is. It's up to us to say, okay, I don't really like that teaching, but I need to wrestle with it instead of Google it. Just Google it. No, you Google the truth, you're gonna get all sorts of answers. You ask your friends, they're gonna get all sorts of answers. You go to the catechism, you're going to get the answer. It's so wonderful to live moment to moment in God's presence. Because if we do that, and we're proud, and we're happy to invite Jesus into every moment, today will be good spiritually We'll have peace in any circumstance, and tomorrow will be even better. Spiritually speaking, we live moment to moment. The next day after that will be even better spiritually, and better, and better, and better, and better, until we reach union. Live this moment, every moment, inviting God in. You can't go wrong. You will never take the wrong path, ever, because you will be open and alert, as we say in Advent, to every sign that God gives you. He's going to give you clues. He's going to give you signs. You'll be able to see them. You'll be able to hear them because you know how to listen and you know how to see. You will not go wrong Ever, you are protected by the blood of Jesus. He does not want you harmed, ever. We harm ourselves. We harm our souls. Sure, we might get hurt physically. It is true. We do suffer physically. But we can suffer physically and go straight into paradise and never suffer physically again. That is our destiny. Don't try to escape temporary pain if it means it's going to lead to a longer pain. I'll give you an example of this. So it's easy to drink a lot of alcohol and end up in someone's room when we shouldn't. It's hard to deal with the consequences of that one night. It's easy to start eating too much or eating the wrong foods. It's hard to stop and heal and undo that behavior and start the right one. 
It's easy to slip. It's hard to get out of it. I have an analogy for you, and <laughs> this came to mind when I was preparing this talk. I was seven years old, and I remember it very well. I was in the back seat of my parents' Ford LTD station wagon. They certainly don't make cars like that anymore. I think it got about five miles to the gallon. And we're on a family trip. And my dad looks at the map and he says, oh, this is a good route to take. And we come to this barrier and it says clearly don't pass. And my dad looks at the map and he says, well, if we just go through this barrier and over this mountain, it's gonna be easier. We could save a lot of time. It'll only take an hour. And my mom said, I don't know. I think there's a barrier for a reason. He's like, no problem, trust me. So he goes out and he opens up the barrier and I'm thinking, what's dad doing? You know, my sister and brother and I are in the back seat going, where's he going? So he starts going forward. We're going on these mountain roads. It's getting a little bumpy. So dad stops the car. He's picking up some boulders that are in the way. He's throwing them aside. And my mom's saying, honey, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. He's like, honey, I'm a man. <laughs> no problem. And I'm thinking, okay, dad, dad knows what he's doing. You know, so dad keeps driving. It's getting windier, higher. The boulders are getting bigger and bigger. Soon my dad's coming out to get these huge rocks that he's shoving off the road. At this point, I'm thinking, what is wrong with my father? I'm seven years old and I know more than he is. We keep trudging forward. And finally, we can't go any further. The road ends. And then the whole car is just going, I told you so. And dad's like, all right, yeah, okay. Yeah, well now, okay, quiet kids. We just gotta back it up, back it up. Everything's gonna be fine, back it up. So backing up, how hard is backing up versus going forward? It's always harder, right? It's harder to stop because it's embarrassing. We have to admit to ourselves and sometimes to others that we've been going down the wrong road. And we don't like that feeling. It feels really yucky. That's why a lot of us, like my dad, just, oh, it's just <laughs> forge ahead, make it work. And then you feel so small, right, as you're backing up. I've felt this so many times in my life when I realized I was think I was doing the right thing, but I wasn't. It's not a good feeling, but it's the right thing to do. Being humbled is not a bad thing. Being humbled is a good thing. It's a holy thing. It's called humility. God bless him. Dad showed humility. Like, okay, we're back, backing it up. Took forever. I mean, Ford LTD, long car, going back, back. So. We had to go back and then we had to start over. And then we had to go down the right road. So what happens is, it's hard to stop, much harder to pull back. We miss the graces that we would have gotten in the first place had we took the right road then. Those graces are gone. What happens is, Satan loves to keep us in tomorrow or yesterday to take us away from this eternal present moment. Why? Because if we're gonna get a grace, we're only going to get it in the present moment. That's the only time that graces are available to us. Every moment that we live, God has a grace that he wants to give us because he loves us. So if we're worried about yesterday, which already happened, those graces are gone. Don't think about yesterday too much. Think about yesterday in order to heal from it, but not to beat yourself up with guilt, not to go over what's done. What's happening right now in the present moment? That's where God is. Don't think about tomorrow because you know what? We don't even know if tomorrow will come for us and tomorrow's graces obviously haven't happened yet. If we're gonna get a grace, we're gonna get it right now. And so people are missing these graces. And when we miss them, yesterday's graces are gone, right? 
it's very important to be alert. Put filters on your iPhones. Make sure your kids don't have an iPhone or an iPad without a filter. Make sure that the usage is very limited for yourself and for them because somebody very ugly is always trying to reach out to you and your children to waste your time or worse than that, to send you somewhere you don't want to go and God doesn't want you to go. Incredibly important people. Kids, wake up. Parents, wake up. I've talked to several priests and they should know because they hear confessions. The kids and the people that you think aren't getting into trouble on the internet and their phones are usually the very ones who are. It's not that they're bad people. We're being tricked. It's an excitement. It's a high. And we lose control of ourselves. So be alert. Be aware. Now... I want to tell a story about a woman I know, Stacy from Illinois, because it breaks my heart and it shows how we really want to follow the right road the first time from this moment on. She wanted so badly to be married. She wanted so badly to be kid, to have kids, but she didn't want to do it God's way. She wanted to do it her way. Her boyfriend didn't want to marry her but she was trying to force the issue. She ends up unable to have kids with him, unmarried, but trying, ends up doing in vitro fertilization. Why does the church say that's wrong? Well, because you actually create human beings. Human beings are created at conception. You freeze them. You freeze your own children. And then if an implantation of that child in the womb doesn't work, they're killed. That's what you're doing to your own offspring. It's not God's plan, but she was forcing, forcing what she wanted, forcing this. She ends up with the man, staying with him for years and years and years. And God finally tells her, I mean, he was telling her through people, through situations, through the way the man was behaving every year, time to break up, time to stop, realize that was a mistake, back up, heal, because I have something better for you. I have something beautiful planned for you because he always does. If he asks you to give up something that's not his plan for you and to back up and go another way, that way is better, folks. It's painful at first. That's why we don't do it sometimes. It's like yucky. She never got the graces that God wanted for her. That door closed. Too many years went by, too many years, she would not do it God's way. She was forcing her way. Now it's too late. That's a great sadness for her. That's a great sadness for God. All the more reason we need to be alert, not distracted. Follow the church's teachings. Each day will be full of of hope. Each day will be full of great meaning. Each day has the potential, even in suffering, for great, great joy. As it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, therefore, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us stay alert and sober. I'm going to ask Brian to make a few announcements, and then after he does, I have a final story that I'd like to share with you. Let's thank Christine before she comes up. Right after Christine concludes, we're going to be moving seamlessly into our regularly scheduled.